Hi everyone! This video is an overview of how you're going to be tested on experimental design and data analysis on the MCAT. At the end of this video, I'll be going through a few drills and skills that will help you get those extra points on test day in these two areas. So, there's a lot of content to know for the MCAT, as we all know, but all the content review in the world isn't going to get you the score you want on its own. You're going to need to read complicated passages about experiments and studies and look at data, graphs, figures, and tables and be able to interpret them correctly in order to get those points on test day. So those two skills on the MCAT are known as skill three, reasoning about the design and execution of research, and skill four, data-based and statistical reasoning. So that's what we're going to go through today. So, in a general sense, the test makers want to assess whether you can read an experiment and or data and understand it, even if the content of the experiment is new to you. So what that boils down to is a set of very specific skills. You need to be able to correctly identify variables and controls. This includes independent and dependent variables and negative and positive controls. You need to be able to correctly interpret various graphs, figures, and tables using trends within those figures, axes and understanding the axes, units, and statistical significance. Then you need to be able to correctly identify the hypothesis or hypotheses that the passage is referencing and whether or not the data actually supports that hypothesis. Finally, you got to be able to differentiate between accurate conclusions that we can make about the data versus out of scope conclusions. And we're going to use certain terms to help us do that, such as correlation versus causation, populations and samples, and random versus systematic errors. So those are your core competencies for these two skills. In addition, for the psych -soc section, you will also be asked to answer questions on things like demographic data and health outcomes and types of study designs that can be done on people such as cross-sectional or observational or longitudinal studies. Okay, so that's our overview. Now, how do we prepare for this in an effective way? So I'd like to think, I'd like you to think of these questions as the cars of the science sections. For the most part, as long as you have a basic comprehension of how to read graphs and figures and how to identify variables, you'll be able to use that knowledge to get what you need on test day. The rest of the information should be right there in front of you if you're able to interpret it. So let's start with the first step, finding the right information in the passage. So whenever a paragraph or passage includes an experiment, study, or figure, you want to identify and write down these five things. Your independent variables, your dependent variables, your controls, your statistical significance, and your hypothesis and whether or not it was supported. So let's get more specific with the type of data you'll see. If you're given a graph, read the description or legend first, then look at the axes. Generally speaking, the independent variables on the x-axis and the dependent variables on the y-axis. We also want to know what type of relationship we have. Is it linear? Is it exponential? Is it logarithmic? Is it sigmoidal? Is it direct or inverse? All of these are words that you should be comfortable with on test day. So let's take a look at a figure. So here is, it says figure two. So first step, we want to read the description. Always read the description. I know it's a common thing we skip on test day, but that description will give you a good sense of what the figure is telling you. So in this case, we have time dependence of radioactivity of this element, all right? So take a look at the figure, take a second, look at your axes, try to determine your variables and your trends. Okay, so x-axis, usually our independent variable, right? So this is time. This is what we're kind of tracking and what we're able to control in the experiment. In this case, the unit for that is hours. Always important to look at what unit the variables are in. So this is in hours. So if they ask you a question in minutes, right? We know we're needing to convert that a little bit. Y-axis, radio activities in MBQ. Maybe that's unfamiliar to you. In fact, it should be, it's not on our list. What should be familiar is what that big M is referring to. That's referring to our mega, which is 10 to the 6. You do need to know all the metric prefixes. Here's a chart 
very quickly of the metric prefixes you'll be expected to know on test day. Okay, back to our figure. So we have the mega, and then we have BQ, which you're not expected to know, but as a fun fact, BQ is named after Henry Becquerel, Becquerel, I think is how it's pronounced, and it's a measure of radioactivity. Cool? Uh, but we can determine that based on the label of the y-axis. So here we have our two variables, right? We have our units, and now we can say, okay, our control is probably just our time zero, right? That's that point at which we're at maximum radioactivity. And now let's look at the trend. So we definitely see an inverse trend, right? As time increases, radioactive, uh, radioactivity decreases, but it's not quite like a straight line, right? It's this like little teeny curve. So does anyone know what that is called? If you know what that's called, write it down. Yeah, it's called a reciprocal graph, which means that we're never gonna cross over the axis into the negative values. So our relationship is here is y equals one over x, all right? And when, so as x time goes up, y goes down, but never past zero. Okay, so let's try another one a little bit more experimental. Here's this figure, figure four. And again, we read the description and go ahead and take a second, write down as much as you can about this figure based on our five key components we talked about earlier. Okay, so pro-insulin synthesis in wild type and CDKAL1 minus dash minus. Okay, so just as a reference, something you should be familiar with is our knockout mice terminology. So whenever we have kind of a, an acronym referring to a gene in this case, which is in italics, and then it says minus slash minus, that just means that both alleles of that gene are knocked out or are absent. So in these modified mice, the CDKAL1 gene is absent for both alleles, right? Both alleles do not have this gene active. And then wild type is our normal mice, right? And then we have under basal condition or stimulated condition, and the differences between basal and stimulated is the amount of glucose concentration we have. Stimulated has much higher than our basal condition, and it's in millimolar. Okay, so so far so good. The last thing to note here is that there is a p-value 0.05, and it's denoted by a student test, right? So we can infer maybe they might ask us about this student, whether or not they did a good job. Okay, so now let's take a look at the graph itself and identify our independent and dependent variables. When the graph or figure has multiple bars or lines, the multiple bars or lines are usually the independent variables as well. So our wild type versus our knockout mice are gonna be one independent variable, and then the amount of glucose is gonna be our second independent variable. Our dependent variable, yep, y-axis, is gonna be the relative pro-insulin synthesis. All right, that's the thing we're measuring. So now what's our control or controls? Yeah, so our first control usually whenever we have wild type, that's generally going to be our control because we're controlling against the natural state, right? So our wild type mice are going to be our one control. And then our basal condition can be considered another control, right? Basal kind of baseline condition. And so we're really comparing the stimulated condition and the knockout mice to our wild type and our lower concentration of glucose. So what do we see there as a trend? So take a second and write down the overall conclusion you could make about this graph. All right, so make sure that you noticed our statistical significance, right? We can only say one thing, which is that when in the stimulated condition, the absence of the CDKL1 gene, the minus minus, results in less pro-insulin synthesis than the wild type. That's it, that's all we can say based on the statistical significance in this figure. We can speculate on why, but without more data or explanation from the passage, this is as far as we can go. Okay, so a table is gonna be a little different. Generally speaking, the independent variables can be either the rows or columns, and the data in the cells represent the dependent variables. So when looking at the table, we wanna establish overall trends. Uh, are the numbers increasing or decreasing across the rows or columns? And carefully note the units or description and any p-values, which can be note denoted by either asterisk or plus minus numbers, which is the confidence interval. So take a look at this table, take a second, and determine as much as you can about the information in this table.
All right, so our first two columns are showing us our independent variable, right, our types of enzymes, and the second column is really just getting more specific about the differences between those three enzymes, so it's easy to look at. And then column three and column four are our measurements on those three enzymes, right? So they're referring to our dependent variable. So if we take a look at KM, our third column, it's in micromolar, and if you look carefully, the confidence intervals overlap. So for example, in the wild type, the actual range with the possible number of Km is anywhere from 3.56 to 3.04, and that absolutely overlaps with all the confidence intervals of the other two. So there's not much that can be said about the Km. They overlap. They're not different from each other. But conversely, let's take a look at Vmax in nanomoles per minute per nanomole of this other acronym, right? So checking out you know, the fact that we're probably going to have to do some unit conversion there. But absolutely, there's a difference, right? The wild type is significantly larger than either of the two other enzymes, and they go in a decreasing trend down the column. All right, so again, we can't make any more comments than that, but in combination with what we know about the types of substitution, if you're checking out those amino acids, and what's referred to in the passage, we can make some assumptions about this data that allow us to answer questions. All right, so hopefully, as we did this together, you know it's like, hey, wait, she's digging way more into these graphs and figures and tables than I normally do. I normally glance at them, say, okay, cool, data, and move on. That alone can really drastically improve your speed and performance on test day, because if there's a figure, table, or graph, you can pretty much guarantee that they're gonna be tested, right? So taking the time to look at it in context of the reading will make your interpretation so much clearer when you get to those tricky questions. In general, when answering questions about experimental design, it is essential that you stay within the scope of the data given to you. Many of the wrong answers that you'll see about experimental design go way off base off of the variables that you were given in the passage. Just like with cars, avoid extreme language. And extreme language in the sciences counts as all, conclusive, or causal, right? Anything that says causal, you want to treat with caution. When asked how to improve a study, make sure that the answer you choose relates to the variables in the passage and do not introduce a new variable. And lastly, remember that the goal of the experiment is going to help you answer the question. So keep that front of mind as you're eliminating answer choices. There's a lot of nuance to these skills. So please leave a note in the comments if you would like a video on any of the specific topics we discussed in this video. Thanks so much for joining me and happy studying.